Well, I'm glad to see you made it out through the snow this morning. That was kind of an early April Fool's gift, wasn't it? Goodness sakes. I'm also glad to, to hear that the donuts arrived today, unlike last week, when, as Perry said, we had to live through the great donut famine of 2018. <laughs> so it's going to be a good day. I, I should say a word about the Lenten offering because I've been to Sierra Leone. I know Bishop Yambasu very well, and I've actually been to the site where the Enterprise uh, School will be built. It's a wonderful opportunity to change the lives of young people in that part of Africa, to give them a new way of understanding work and entrepreneurship and starting their own businesses and thus creating jobs which are so desperately needed. So I do encourage you to give generously. I know. Uh, this church is generous in so many ways, including recently paying off the debt on our building, but it'd be great to extend that to other parts of the world that are not so blessed with material goods. So I hope you'll, hope you'll get engage in that Lenten offering. And Perry tells me you can bring that offering this week, next week, or any time the next few weeks. We'll be glad to receive it, so thank you. All four of the Gospels record a triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and this year the reading is from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 11. I'm going to read selected verses. As I do so, I invite you to listen for the contrast, the contrast between what Jesus does and what the crowd wants, because I'm going to talk about Jesus as the humble Messiah. So here are these words from the Gospel of Mark. The disciples brought the colt, it was a young donkey, to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches, palm branches, that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who were following began shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. May God bless the reading of God's word. Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you. For you, O oh God, you're the one who is our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Palm Sunday. Here's a picture of uh, what it may have looked like. And it looks rather picturesque, and when the children come and wave their palm branches, it, it looks beautiful. But behind that scene, or as a part of that scene, there is this tug-of-war going on between what the crowd wanted from Jesus and Jesus' own central focus upon his mission and purpose. Did you hear it? They began shouting, Hosanna, which means, come, Lord, save us. And they began waving palm branches, which sounds nice, but do you know what palm branches represented in the day of Jesus? It represented a symbol of military victory. That's what the Maccabees waved as they retook the temple from the Greeks. They came in waving palm branches. And so still today in the Middle East, to wave a palm branch is to say, let's fight and let's win. In fact, in 1948, when the United Nations reformed the nation of Israel and allowed them to be reestablished as a country, there was a great debate among those Israelis about what their flag should be, and many people wanted a flag with a simple white background and a palm branch on it. But it was decided, no, we better not do that. That's too provocative. That might cause our Arab neighbors to want to go to war with us, and so they chose instead the Star of David because a palm branch is not just a sweet little thing children wave. It was a symbol saying, let's fight and let's win and let's defeat those Romans who are our oppressors. And they began yelling for David, uh, Jesus to become the new King David. They wanted him to reestablish Israel as a great nation again, to throw off the Romans. They, they wanted him to come in on a war horse, waving a, a sword perhaps, or with legions of angels or at least lots of followers. But instead... Jesus rode into town on a donkey. It was as if the crowds were trying to force him into being a new king. They did that before. If you read back in the Gospel of John chapter 6, the first time Jesus fed the crowds, it says, the people wanted to make Jesus a king by force, so he withdrew from them. He ran away. He escaped those efforts, and on this day we call Palm Sunday, 
Jesus also tried to avoid the pressure of the crowd so that he could stay true to his mission. So I wonder, were they disappointed? Were the people of Jesus' day disappointed by Palm Sunday? They wanted to have someone come save them. They wanted a new king. They wanted perhaps a religious leader who would help them obey all those commandments in what we call the Old Testament. But in contrast, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah. Lo, your king comes to you, humble and riding on a donkey. Now, if you put that in context, Mark also tells us the very next day, what did Jesus do? He went into the temple and he chased out all the money changers who were cheating the people when they came to worship. It was quite a clever ploy. When you came to worship in the temple, you had to exchange your ordinary money for temple money. We could do that. We could have you exchange your money for United Methodist money when you come here to worship. And then they sold you the things you needed to worship, like if you're going to offer a lamb or fruit or whatever it might be. Then you had to buy their materials, which was also at a jacked up price. Someone has said it was like buying sandwiches at the airport. <laughs> so they had this scheme going to cheat the people. And Jesus came in on Monday of Holy Week and he overturned the tables and he drove out all the money changers. So here's this guy we wanted to be our king to get rid of the Romans, and instead he goes to the temple and attacks our religious institution. Do you think the people were disappointed? <laughs> they were looking for something different. But Jesus seems to have stayed true to his task. What, what was Jesus thinking when all that was going on? What was Jesus thinking? Well, thanks to the Apostle Paul, we know what he was thinking. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians and he says, advising us to have the same thinking. He says, Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not require, regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but rather he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You think the crowds were disappointed? Maybe some people in the crowd on Sunday were in the same crowd on Friday who yelled out, Crucify him, get rid of this guy. Maybe they were disappointed he didn't live up to what they wanted. Peer pressure. It can be pretty strong. My, my Aunt Lessie lived to be almost 96 years old. She was just one of my favorite people. She lived alone as a widow for over 30 years in a little house in Jefferson, Indiana, outside of Frankfurt, not too far from here. Until finally the last few months of her life, she had to move to a senior citizen center where she spent most of her days walking around room to room with her little walker, visiting and praying for what she called those old people, <laughs> many of whom were 20 years younger than she was. Well, she never had children, didn't have much family other than our family, so I went to see her on, the, on her 95th birthday. And I told her I was coming, and I got there and said, maybe we can visit a while and then, then have lunch, thinking we'd go down to the dining hall. She said, great, let's go out for pizza. I said, really? She said, oh, I'm tired of this food they have here. Let's go for pizza. So got her, her and her walker in my car, and we went for pizza. And over lunch, I asked her, what's it like to be 95 years old? You know what she told me? She said, well, the good thing is I don't have to worry about peer pressure anymore. <laughs> I outlived all of them. But you and I, we know about peer pressure, don't we? We know what it's like when the crowd pulls and tugs us in all sorts of ways. We also know what it's like to feel disappointed that someone doesn't fulfill our desires and our demands for what they become. So I wonder, how about us? Have we ever been disappointed in Jesus? Have we ever looked around for a different kind of Messiah? Have we only wanted to follow a Christ who's successful, who will perform for us? The words in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar say it this way, Hey, Zanna, ho, Zanna, 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 hey, Zanna, Zanna, ho, Zanna, hey, hey, JC, won't you smile at me? Jesus Christ, if you're divine, turn my water into wine. Prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. Hey, Zanna, hey, Zanna. It's kind of an irreverent song, but it really describes the crowd of that day and maybe, maybe people in our culture today. We want... 
We want a Jesus who'll perform for us. We say, give me a Jesus, give me a miracle, Jesus, and I'll believe in you. Answer my prayers my way, Jesus. We want a user-friendly Jesus, don't we? I recently, before I started being here as your interim pastor, I was in a church, I heard the pastor say that the problem with most of our prayers is we pray to God with our answers and ask God to provide our answers. And instead, he said, we need to pray to God with our questions, our concerns, our burdens, our hurt. We need to bring those to God and allow God to provide us with God's answers. And when I heard that pastor say that, I realized it's exactly what I've been doing wrong recently. I have a family member I'm very concerned about, and I've been praying for him, but I've been praying for God to fix his situation the way I think it ought to be fixed. And I've been getting a little irritated with God that God hasn't done that yet. And when I heard that pastor say those words, I realized, aha, I'm looking for a user-friendly Jesus, a God who will respond the way I want. I'm like those crowds on Palm Sunday saying, Hosanna, come Lord, save us, be the Messiah we want you to be. When instead, Jesus says, I'm going to be who God calls me to be. And it means riding into town as a, on a donkey as a symbol of peace. So Jesus is in many ways the humble Messiah. Now let me say quickly what humility is not. Humility is not being a doormat. And humility especially is not allowing other people to abuse us. And humility is not weakness. In fact, humility requires strength. It takes strength, like Jesus, to be humble, to be obedient, to be faithful to who we are. Maybe the kind of humility and strength that people like Mother Teresa have demonstrated for us. For most of my years as bishop here in Indiana, my secretary was a guy named Ed Metzler who lives right over here in Whitestown. Ed is retired military, and what he did in the military is he was a columnist, a writer for Stars and Stripes newspaper in the military. So he was a great secretary for me, and he even called me sir a lot. Although sometimes I think it was with a bit of an edge. Remember one uh, week he gave me my materials for the Sunday to a church I was going to go preach, and, and I, I looked at the materials, I said, well, Ed, what's the special occasion? And he said, well, you are, sir, believe it or not. <laughs> but Ed told me that while he was stationed in Europe in the military, he got a chance to meet Mother Teresa, not long before she, in fact, received the Nobel Peace Prize. He said an invitation went out for a, a special press conference where media could come and meet with Mother Teresa, including media in the military. So he asked his commander, and he was assigned to go to this other town to be with the crowd and meet Mother Teresa. But when he got there, he was the only one who showed up. There was some mistake in the invitation, and particularly in the cancellation of the event, he was the only guy who showed up. And he was encountered, he said, by a large German nun who told him, you're the only one here, Mother Teresa doesn't have time for you. But Mother Teresa was in the next room and she overheard that. And she came out and said, no, the young man is here. He was invited, I will spend time with him. And Ed got to interview Mother Teresa one-on-one -on -one for 45 minutes. Well, I was very curious, I said, what was she like? He said, well, first of all, she's really little. She's listed as five, she was listed as being five feet tall and there's, there's no way she was shorter than that. And then Ed stopped and he said something I've always remembered. He said, she was both the most humble and the most powerful person that I've ever met. We don't often think of it that way, do we? We think of strength as, you know, you gotta be tough, you gotta be overcoming, you gotta be Hosanna, come save us, be the new king. But in fact, Jesus models for us and special people in our lives have demonstrated for us that strength and humility actually go together. Well, I never met Mother Teresa, but I did have a chance a few years ago to meet Nelson Mandela, who became the first black president of South Africa. We were having our Council of Bishops, which is all the bishops, the United Methodist bishops around the world. We met in Mozambique, Africa. And because his wife is from Mozambique, Nelson Mandela came and surprised us to speak to us. He was quite frail by then. He didn't live too many more years. 
And I would say the same thing Ed said about Mother Teresa. Nelson was amazingly humble, but strong. I remember one thing in particular he said to us. He said after being in prison, was it 27 years, I think? He was in prison by the apartheid government. He said when he walked out of prison, he realized that he must turn around and forgive those who had imprisoned him. Because he said, otherwise, I would have still been in prison spiritually. I had to forgive them. Humility and strength. That's what we see on Palm Sunday. We see Jesus riding into Jerusalem. The crowd shouting and trying to make him into their kind of king, their kind of Messiah. But he comes in humble, obedient, and yet strong. Somehow, those go together, and maybe along with that, a little bit of sense of humor. One of my favorite drawings of Jesus is the one called Jesus Laughing. It comes from children's literature, children's Sunday school literature, several years ago. And the point of it is that we know Jesus laughed a lot. We know that he enjoyed people, that he had table fellowship and told stories with his disciples. We know because the religious leaders criticized him for having too much fun with his disciples. They said, you ought to be more like John the Baptist, who fasted and was stern. Of course, they'd criticize John the Baptist, too, because that's what the crowd does. You can't please the crowd either direction. But we know Jesus had a sense of humor. In fact, Elton Trueblood has written a wonderful book called The Humor of Christ, in which he said, many of the teachings of Jesus only make sense when we realize that he told those with a twinkle in his eye, that he got people to laugh. That when he was trying to make a point about how our possessions can burden us, he said it's harder for a, a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel loaded down with stuff to get through the eye of a needle. And Elton Trueblood says people would have laughed at that ridiculous image, but they would have gotten the point Jesus was making. Hmm. Humor. So in my travels around among churches over the years, I was in many churches where I saw this poster hanging in in one of the children's classrooms, and one church I visited told me a wonderful story about it. They said they were remodeling and adding on to their church a few years ago, and because of the remodeling mess, they were meeting as a church council in one of the children's classrooms where this picture happened to be hanging. And somehow, as things went along during that meeting, they got into quite a big argument about what color of carpet to put in the new edition. And it got kind of, kind of ugly until finally in the midst of all that, one woman looked up and saw that picture of Jesus laughing and she got tickled. She thought, how ridiculous is this? Jesus must be laughing to think we would be arguing about the color of the carpet instead of the ministry we can do in that new building. And she started laughing. Of course, people looked at her like, what's wrong with you? Why are you laughing? And, and she couldn't talk. She just pointed to the picture laughing. And they all got laughing had a great laugh together, and then they worked through their problems. Maybe humility and strength and a sense of humor kind of all go together. I don't know. It doesn't tell us Jesus was laughing when he rode into town on a donkey, but I'm sure some people were laughing at the spectacle. A donkey? Not a war horse? Not an army, not swords. This is the guy we've heard about from Galilee, and he rides into town on a donkey. What is he doing? What he was doing was being faithful and staying focused upon his mission, his purpose for which God had called him. So as we travel through this week we call Holy Week, as we travel toward Palm, uh, toward Maundy Thursday and Good Friday and next Sunday, Easter Sunday, I invite us to keep our eyes upon the Jesus who shows us that humility and strength and maybe some humor, they go together. That following God is not some religious serious stuff, but it's the stuff of, of being faithful, of being obedient. Most of all, we need to keep our eyes upon Jesus because he's the one who will not disappoint us. He's not a disappointing Messiah. He may be a humble Messiah. But he's a faithful Messiah, and we are invited to keep our eyes upon Jesus as we travel with him this holy week. Will you pray with me?
God, we thank you for the images of this special Sunday. We're grateful for the children and their joy and waving palm branches. We're grateful for that picture of Jesus riding into town resolute, humble, and obedient. And we pray that in our lives, when we are pulled and tugged to and fro by the peer pressures we face, we pray that we might also be humble and yet strong in our obedience to you. So help us, O oh God, help us to keep our eyes upon Jesus as we travel through this week. For we pray in his name. Amen.